It's noon, let's get started. Get all the way through this uh, section today, but who knows. Um, so, can somebody summarize where we left off on Thursday? We were defending defending a house or uh, and deciding what uh, that meant as far as uh, what we had to defend against, that went into what our goals would be, and now our policies, yep. and how we're going to structure those policies. Right, so we came up with policies, what we wanted to be allowed or not allowed in our house scenario, and we discussed and came up with mechanisms hmm. to try to enforce that. And then we talked about some of the pros and cons of those mechanisms, right? Sometimes they didn't line up exactly or do exactly what we want, but they were uh, pretty good nonetheless. What about the different types of security policies? How to actually define security policies? Anybody over here? example was XML as a policy, so XACML is a policy language. And the idea there is you kind of have both worlds where it's, yes, there is some English natural language in there, but if your policy is explicitly defined in a machine-readable format so that other systems can, con can consume them and use them. Perfect. All right. So how do we know if our security policy is correct? What do we mean by correct? Introduce any more. Errors. It doesn't do anything else that it isn't supposed to do, right? So you could have a door that lets you in if you have the key, and that would do what it's supposed to do. But if the door just happens to swing open if you breathe on it, then <laughs> it's probably doing more than you want it to do, and so it's not really what you want, right? So how can we determine if our security policies are correct? Is this easy? It sounds easy, right? Do you know when you're? How do I know when your programming assignments, your professors in class, how do they know when your programming assignments are correct? They don't, they just guess, no. <laughs> they use test cases, right, to do what? can't test every case. You can't test every case, right? So there could be a case that you're not testing, which I know from a fact happens a lot of times in programming assignments. You say, oh, I'm failing these test cases. Why? My program looks correct to me. Yeah. No, I mean, because it's a black, it's a black box of code approach. You actually don't see how the code's functioning. So technically, you could be programming it to take known out inputs and output what you're know, supposed to know, but can't handle the situations outside of that selective. Right, exactly. So this brings up the case where you have, uh, and I've actually seen some, well, eh, not too much of this, but you could just write a big switch statement that if it sees this input, output this output, if it sees this input, output this output. So you haven't really built anything except to solve and pass these test cases. Yeah, in the back. Uh, your security policy could be used for something like that. Your 
security policy can be used for something that is unintended for. Can you elaborate? Human dressed up as a dog, or inside of a Trojan horse. <laughs> Going off that analogy, but the Trojan horse idea, right? So something that does not look like a person that maybe now makes a security policy. So what would that? What's the problem of the security policy there? Is it a problem of the security policy, or is it a problem of the implementation of this policy? I mean, I would think it'd be a little of both, right? Like, because not in order to, you just have to be thorough on uh, what inputs you think you might be getting. You have to try to think how your program would be broken and et cetera. And so in both uh, implementing the policy and the policy themselves, you have to try to be thorough and specific with it. Right, so, so yeah, so there's kind of, well, when you say, hey, only authorized people are allowed to enter or exit a building, let's say, going back to our building analogy, there's an implicit assumption in there that you can define, you can identify and know what a person is, right? So this kind of gets that idea about what if a dog, I mean, a real dog shows up, or what if a mechanical dog shows up, or what if a drone shows up, uh, what if a human dressed up as one of these things, right? So. If we think, okay, if we want to talk about the correctness of our security policy, did we make any assumptions? So in our housing example, did we make any assumptions there? So we just talked about the people, defining what people were. Yeah? I assumed it was in the United States. We assumed in the United States. How does that change your assumption of the correctness of the security policy? We had, we 
definitely assume things about the environment. And if we were really serious that, hey, these mechanisms are key to ensuring our security policy, we need to know how those mechanisms can fail and what assumptions those mechanisms are based on because that is something that an attacker could potentially cut. So what happens if they cut the power to our house and our security system goes down and our awesome uh, smart lock system also goes down? Right? Do the doors just fly open at that point? What happens? So kind of these, these uh, we talked about a couple things, right? So we're assuming essentially that the policy is correct. So this kind of goes back to the people are, and being able to identify people, right? So there's an assumption there that the policy is correct. So how do we verify that the policy is correct? <clears throat> so, that, so one thing would be test cases, like a program. So how would you create test cases in this scenario? What was that? Like make sure someone can enter our house that wasn't supposed to be there. But how would you create a test case for this? Like a program is easy, right? You have input, you have a program, you feed the input to the program, you say if the output is what I expect, then the program passes this test case. How can you do this for a security policy? Hire a consultant. Hire somebody to do it for you. That's what I'm training you to be, so you can be hired. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say that. Hire somebody? Hire someone to break in? Yeah, okay. You have, to, you have to access a database. Like you have a database that you're constantly getting validation and checks from. Validation and checks from where? Well, like you have a database or in the, in the case of like how do you know this pol our policy is correct, mm -hmm. like you want to you need to have stored who are valid. Like who are valid. So the policy is like, hey, go to the check the database if back in it, like you said, you can't just say yes or no that. But, but how do you know that that policy is correct of stating that the people in the database are authorized users? Yeah, in the back. implementation of the mechanisms enforcing the policy, we can instead take that idea and apply the threats that we've already thought about and work through in our heads. Okay, would this policy counter this threat? Would this policy counter this threat? So essentially, the threats that we've already come up with can be our essentially our test cases to try to say whether the policy is correct in some sense. And remember, it's correct against our threat. What we consider, we'll get into risk later, but it's all contextual, right? So depending on where the house is located, we may have different threats that we care about. Um, if I'm storing, like if you think of Fort Knox essentially as a house, right, that needs to be secured, they have a completely different threat model than you would have in your apartment, right? So they're considering and thinking about different threats than you are. So we have the policy is correct. So if we can test the policy, if we have the policy written in a mathematical language, then what could we possibly do? Build the mechanisms described in the policy and test those? Is that kind of the same thing? Not yet. We can write a proof. So if it's mathematically described, we can try to actually prove that this policy is correct. What's the difficulty there? What? <laughs> was, the, was the response being able to do a proof? Yes. Yeah. In a general case or in a specific case? Um, so you could do this, right? But what's the difficult? What are you trying to prove? Yeah. Uh, some things just aren't provable. Yeah, so it may not be, well, it. So you have to think, so we've lifted the policy into kind of this abstract math language, mm -hmm. right? So we can manipulate the policy. What else do we have to lift into math? So we have the policy is formally defined. What are we trying to prove? <clears throat> that it works. That doesn't work. Not 
talking about mechanisms now, just policies. That is correct. That's correct, right? So remember, we talked about working is just different than correct. It's, it's similar, but um, right. But we want to prove that the policy is correct. So we've lifted the policy into a mathematical language. What do we need to do with our notion of correctness? Describe that mathematically. We need to actually be able to describe that mathematically, right? Because we can't prove something that we can't express in mathematic in our mathematical formalism. And so therein lies the problem, right? So if we can accurately specify our notion of correctness in mathematical terms, and we're confident that that mathematical expression is actually what we want to prove, right? This is always the problem when it comes to using math and using formalism to try and prove something. You could prove that this system is, this policy is correct, but if your correctness notion is not exactly what you want, you're still kind of have the same problem. Um, so these are all different sides of the same coin that can help you think about this kind of thing. So then there's the other aspect that we've been talking about is that the mechanism actually implements the policy that we want, right? So this is, so now we actually have a system, we've designed mechanisms to implement this policy. How do we know that those are correct? So what do we care about with the correctness here? So that the mechanisms you're using actually work for the policy objectives? Yeah, so that the mechanisms that we're using <coughs> correctly enforce the policy. So this kind of already assumes that the policy is correct, right? So here we're just focused on do these mechanisms actually implement the policy? So how do we do this? So we've talked about some ideas, but so how would we, how would you try to convince me that yes, your mechanisms are correct? Yeah? Well, just test case like, let's take the house analogy. If you're trying to keep somebody out of the house by using a key, you send people to the house to try to get in the house. Without a key. You know? yeah. Or if you're trying to keep somebody out of your website, you send people there to try to get in. Yeah, any other ideas? So we can maybe, similar to the test case, we can actually create real threats and launch them at the system, controlled threats that we control, right? And see whether they can bypass the mechanisms and ultimately bypass it and, and invalidate the security policy. Is that all we can do? What's the problem with that approach? Oh, sorry, can I back? Yeah. I was going to say you have to make sure that each individual mechanism is working the way you expect it to. Mm, so we, there may be correctness in the mechanism itself, right? That's a good point. So we may, we care not only does the mechanism enforce the policy, but does the mechanism actually do what it says it does? This would be especially useful if you're buying something non-standard, right? So if you're buying a lock for a door, I think you can be roughly, you know, safe that it does kind of what it says it does. If you're buying some software security product that's telling you it's going to find every single uh, intrusion into your database, that may be a claim that you want to verify or get some notion of how good it actually is so you can separate the marketing claims from what it actually does.
best case is useless. At the worst case, it allows an adversary another avenue into your organization. So it could actually negatively impact security because you install this stupid security camera that is accessible from the internet that any with a hard coded password, right? That would kind of be a good example there. Cool. So we can so we talk about we can actually instantiate like pay someone. So this is consultants coming again, right? You could pay somebody to test your system to try to break into it, to try to violate the policy. What's the downside there? Expensive. It's expensive. Yes, that's probably hopefully why a lot of you are in here and are going to be pursuing a security job because it's a field that pays a lot because you need a lot of expertise in how to bypass these things and um, you need this adversarial mindset. So it's expensive, what else? Yeah. You can break something? They could break something, yeah. So you could actually maybe damage the system or cause something to go down, yeah. Um, if they like report or tell their people this that have maybe nefarious purposes before you're able to hack it? Yeah, so there's trust. <laughs> That's actually part of what you're paying for in your payment is you're paying not only for them to perform the service, but their silence of the results that they found. So usually as part of your agreement with the company, it would be confidential, but you have to imagine what's this company, you know, maybe you're such a high value target that it's worth them burning their entire reputation to break into your organization. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think we're assuming that they are more skilled than we are by the fact that we're hiring them, but how do we verify their correctness? Yes, there's actually a huge problem with um, hiring security consultants is they can just like the PR of some security product can tell you it's amazing and has 100% effectiveness. Somebody can stand up in front of you and say, I'm a security expert, I have my CISSP certification, I have these five other certs, I've been doing this for 10 years, and you pay them you know, 200 grand or something, and then they just go and run a tool against your website and print you out the exact report from that tool, and good job, you got somebody to actually just like press a tool against your website, but they didn't actually use their full knowledge and capability to ask their own. Yeah, in the back. I get a policy for bounties. Like, for instance, if someone actually does hack into it and they would say, well, I found this bug in your system, it can have a, you pay them a certain something. Yeah, that's interesting. So we, we could, to generalize that a little bit, so we could maybe create some policy that said, hey, if you break into our system and you, tell, and you do no harm and you tell us how you did that, if we agree with your findings and we fix it, then we'll pay you some money. So that can be a way to kind of open up, rather than hiring one person, you can kind of just leave that out there. What does it say about security of your system? Either really confident or you <laughs> Not about that, in general. So these ideas of hiring or getting somebody outside to try to find a flaw in your system. Yeah. Reduce the risk. Reduces what risk? Of being incorrect. Of the incorrect by what? So the, of the implementation of the mechanism and security policy. So if they do in what? So if they come back and say we didn't find anything, it would. Right. It would. It doesn't guarantee it. It doesn't guarantee that there are no flaws in that implementation, but it does reduce the risk. Hopefully, if they're credible and meet all the other stuff that we talked about, that they reduce the risk that there is that it's not correct. I see. So yeah, I think the way of I wouldn't say. It Reduces the risk necessarily. I'd say it increases your assurance that the mechanisms actually enforce your policy correctly. It may also say something about the company itself if they find something or don't find something, right? So just because they can't find something doesn't mean somebody else or bad guys cannot find other ways. Um, yeah. I think that one of the issues of like, so you build a whole system and you hire somebody to test it. You've already spent a ton of money in development. Don't even know if it's secure or not. Yes. Like, so why not build something secure up front? Yes. And do all that before you have to get to the point of penetration. 100% agree. So, this is kind of, it goes back to what we talked about with policies, right? We can think about the threats, articulate the threats against them, and be explicit and argue that yes, this policy will combat this. We can do the same thing with the mechanisms, right? I mean, we can kind of take an idea, okay, if the mechanism, we're assuming it does X, Y, and Z, and if it does, then that prevents this threat, and it prevents this other threat. So you can go through the threats that you've identified. And 
Yeah, so going back, you'd want to do this at all stages, right? So you'd want to, you can analyze the security of a design of a system. You can, and we'll, we'll talk about all these different aspects. That's a great point. Yeah, so uh, if your only idea of security is, hey, I'll build something, and then somebody else will tell me later if it's secure or not, I guarantee you they will say it's not secure. Right? You have to think of, and you have to think about this at every stage of the, say, systems development. So trust, who do we trust? So if we put locks on the door and we say that these locks, so our policy would be something like only people with the key could access our house. So we talked a lot on Thursday about this means that we have to trust the people we give the key to Right, that they won't give it to anybody else. We have to make sure that we keep the key safe. Um, who else do we have to trust that I don't think we've talked about? Yeah. The guy who made the lock. The person who made the lock. Yeah, why do we need to trust that person or company? What are you worried about with them? Uh, make sure they don't have a bunch of extra keys sitting around. Yeah, that they didn't make an extra key that they have. So that's really good. So the person who made the lock, who else? Yeah? The people who have keys because they really don't care what other people who are outside of the organization. People who have keys, who else? Anybody ever be locked out of their house? Mm. What do you do? Locksmith. Locksmith. They call a locksmith. And what does a locksmith do? Crawl through the dog. Huh? Yeah, comes to your house and has professional tools to pick your lock, right, and let you into your house, right? So what are you trusting there about your policies and your mechanism in respect to the locksmith? He won't come back later and make himself at home in your home. Yeah, well, I guess you're assuming that they could do that at any point, right, regardless of whether it's before or after you hire their services. Right? But you're trusting essentially, yeah. Um, yeah, you're trusting that they're going to verify that you actually live there before they let you in, right? They, I don't know. I think it probably varies state to state about what the actual requirements are. Um, maybe it's an ID that you can show that has your address on your driver's license. Again, we get into trust issues because then you have to trust that. How does a locksmith verify that your um, your driver's license is not a fake? Um, you know, difficult problem. So there's trust built in, right? So why do we care about understanding the trust here? Yeah. So it doesn't conflict with our policy. Yes. Either so it doesn't conflict with our policy or that we're aware of it when we think about and consider the threats, right? So maybe for our house, we're okay with trusting locksmiths, right? We would want to be okay trusting locksmiths and that is fine, that's part of our, our security analysis and our, we'll get to like risk, risk analysis, right? A high value target may not want to do that. So they may want to get locks that are anti-locksmith proof or something. I don't know if those exist, but you know, you could try. Or you could add other mechanisms on top of that that would tell you if a locksmith was about to break into your, your place. Cool. All right. This has been a good discussion. So mechanisms, we talked about different types of mechanisms. The one that we focused on a lot is technical, right? So this would be a lock, some piece of software, some part of the operating system. So what are other types of mechanisms? Do we even care about them? Some technical component, but it also uh, 
requires a behavioral change on the part of a person, right? A person has to actually turn that on before they leave. Um, any other examples? Yeah. Don't you have like a guard or someone watching it? Who? So like a, like a human type Yeah, so some, I know some communities will have this. They'll have a security person like driving around or a, uh, I don't know what the proper term for those people are. I was going to say rent a cop. I'm not sure where that falls on the <laughs> correctness scale. Yeah, so you may, act, and so then you're trusting that this person is actually going to do their job and actually drive around and not stay in one place and is going to call in anything bad that they see. It isn't going to be bribed by some criminals to get free access to the whole place. Yeah? You also have to trust that you're not like an old guy who's a cloud judge. Absolutely. Yeah, so you're trusting kind of the judgment of that, that person of when to escalate things when they need to. What other non-technical mechanisms could there be? Yeah. Um, I think we said this last week, but we can have like logical mechanisms where you can sign stuff like the alarm system to when you go to your Yeah. Office. Yeah. So psychological trying to that technically won't prevent or detect anything, but are trying to manipulate the psychology of your attacker to try to say like, oh no, you will get caught, and, and that way. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, yeah. Maybe like. So So changing your behavior, yeah, I just I think about this all the time whenever I like call an Uber to come get me to take me to the airport. You're like casually chatting because you're a person and they're not self-driving cars yet. And <laughs> and they uh, and then you say, Oh yeah, I'm going on a trip, and then you realize, wait a minute, they literally just picked me up from my place of <laughs> I told them I would be gone this weekend. Man, luckily I don't look like I have much. <laughs> so, me out, I guess. Um, so yeah, and people would do this. There's, I think, bots that they can write and do that will track your location that you're posting from on Twitter. If it's not where it normally is, they'll, criminals will know, hey, you're actually out of town, and so they'll try to hit or rob your place then. Um, yeah? So location, location of the house, so they'll make sure some house has a break down and maybe shoot or something versus a site. Yeah, so hiding information, so that would be a less technical, maybe we have big bushes around the uh, perimeter of the property so that people can't actually see where the house is, so they can't plan how to break in. Uh, what about, anybody, there's somebody here who worked in a bank? Not to call anybody out, I just, I feel like I So what, so what were the, what were the mechanisms in place to make sure you couldn't steal money from the till? Yeah, so that's, 
Yeah, so that, then they're incentivizing customers to demand receipts so that that way the teller doesn't accidentally forget to ring something up, in which case the numbers don't match. Yeah, these are all good. So, um, yeah, so it's important to think about these things, right? Because not everything can be technical, right? We can maybe try to ensure that two people are there to open up a safe because we can force them to have two different keys that are farther apart than a human, right? So it's not just one person. If you've seen, I don't know if this happens anymore, but old movies where they launch nukes, right? It's always two people need to turn the key at the same time, right? And so therefore, that way one crazy person can't just launch, well, can't just launch nukes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
well, not all the policy set is covered by the mechanism. Yeah, there are other states that are secure that our mechanism does not allow us to reach, right? So our mechanism in this case would be, I think of restrictive would be a good word for that, right? So our mechanism is actually restricting the states we could possibly be in. So the mechanism is definitely secure, right? And it's secure because why? So it, you can either think of it as it contains only the subset of the secure states, or you could say that it doesn't allow us to access any insecure states, right? Um, those would be the same statements. All right, so that would be one mechanism. Now if I had a mechanism like this, what does that mean? Sounds terrible. So I wouldn't say access necessarily. So I, it, I, it's a trick that we want to we want to talk about in terms of state. So it allows the state to transition into secure, you know, to secure states, but it also allows the state to transition to insecure states. Right? They are states outside the policy that this mechanism allows the state to be in. Um, So a term for this is broad. So it's an overly broad mechanism, right? It allows some things. It doesn't allow other things. So what now? What's the goal? What would be like a perfect mechanism? Yeah. Yeah, something that does exactly, exactly. Perfect. So yeah, some, oops. There's no way I'd be able to draw this, but pretend that this is the best tracing you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> they don't tell you when you're going to be a professor that you have to like draw in front of students. Um, so if it's exactly identical, so all of the secure states are allowed by the mechanism, none of the insecure states are allowed by the mechanism, um, this would be a precise. Make sure I spell that right. <coughs> A precise mechanism, right? So why is this useful? Does it allow me on draw time? <laughs> this allows us to establish our mathematical language when we're defining what we... Yeah, so it's in two ways. So A, it can allow us a precise way to describe whether a mechanism is implementing, is precisely implementing a policy or is secure with respect to a policy or is broad with respect to a policy. It also helps us think about policies and mechanisms, right? And say like, okay, you know, it, is this mechanism doing precisely what my policy wants? Is it more, is it secure and restrictive or is it more broad? Uh, in the real world, what is it likely to be? So locks on a door. Yeah, probably broad. Security cameras, security system that you have to put in the code. Secure. What if somebody just smashes the system or disables the power to the system? Right? So this is kind of the, the double-edged sword here, right? Is the real world is very messy and there are a lot of ways around your mechanisms. So most, most of them will be very broad, right? Because but that's just the nature of what we're doing. And so you have to think about, okay, maybe with respect to the threats or assuming that the power still works, right? Then this mechanism would be secure or would be precise. So um, it helps us to think about these mechanisms. Cool. All right, what does assurance mean? Can't, sorry, so let's go back. Sorry, I want to. Can anybody, what would be a real world secure mechanism? Yeah? Ooh, so what would the policy be there? Huh. Yeah, 
Yeah, so the policy of the pan agreement would be only, like the family could be in there, you know, be the only ones allowed to leave or something. That, that could be a good one. Although, I'm sure there's ways of, into a panic room if you have enough time. You could starve them out, you could like. What was that? <laughs> panic rooms, right? Uh, that's interesting. Any other? Yeah, house. The White House. Uh, but people, well, there was even just a couple months ago, wasn't there somebody who was able to run all the way to the front of the? Yeah, we didn't get inside the house. That's true. Too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. We crashed a plane into it during the. Bill Clinton administration, right? Or was it your Bush? When did the plane crash into it? I do not know. The pilot may have died, but I think that would qualify oh, as entry. But he only landed in the yard, though. He didn't oh, it was in the yard? Yeah, it wasn't. Oh, okay, never mind. It was like a single you, single person. Oh, okay. mm. okay. But there were the, the, the couple that went to the ball that weren't supposed to yes, go to the ball. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. some kind of like yeah. crashers, like they crashed the, the ball that was yeah. held at the White House, if I remember. Um, so yeah, this is kind of the problem. I was thinking maybe like if we check each one of your ASU IDs before you turn in your exam, and we'd have to then verify, also do an online lookup of your photo in the My ASU you know, <laughs> system and your photo there. But even then, that's still not 100% foolproof because you could have just had somebody else take your picture and sign up, right? So it all goes back to the root of trust. Like, um, so yeah, it's actually really difficult to think of a mechanism. Is it too much of kind of a cross in to say, I mean, in, in our personal lives and such like that, we know that trust is earned and trust is very easily broken. So in that type of a way, trust kind of builds upon itself and also when, you, when it is lost. Yes and no. I think the way it breaks down is me thinking, you know, if you are working with someone for a long time and they don't do anything untrustworthy, your trust in them increases. Yeah. Right? If you have a system that's running for a long time and you haven't been breached, does that mean your assurance that the system is secure should be it should. high? Right. It should probably not, because especially if you have no detection mechanisms in place, you're probably <laughs> being owned and you don't know it. Right? That was actually a complaint I've heard from, I, I was at that conference last week on Wednesday, and I think one of the generals said they got major pushback in the military when they started deploying intrusion detection systems. And 
they said, well, why? Why don't you want these things? Well, they come up with all these alerts that were being scanned and all these attacks that were being launched against us. And so like, yeah, that's the problem. Like, yeah, but now we have to deal with it. Like, yes, you, you should have. You already had to deal with it. Now you're just aware of the problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's say if trust, you want to, you know, you want to make the policies the as in, in depth as you can, mm -hmm. create the mechanisms to, to implement those policies, test those systems continuously mm -hmm. to keep building trust in your system. Yes, so that's what, so yes, the over time, but it's not just something that naturally occurs over mm -hmm. time, right? So for instance, I mean, you can be, you can have pretty reasonably, well, there's always still problems, but at least compared to, let's say, early 2000s, even let's say Windows, I mean, we can, I'm going to pick up Linux, but Windows is a good example, right? Early 2000 Windows had tons of vulnerabilities in the kernel that would allow remote, there's code red, Melissa virus, all kinds of these worms and viruses that were spread through email. Um, over time, they've become much uh, more rare because Microsoft developed time and resources into securing the kernel level code and so over time, you can have more assurance that yes, there will still be vulnerabilities in the Windows kernel, but they're not as prevalent as they are essentially nowadays. Um, so because they have process and a continuous process in place about continuous improvement and refinement. So yeah, going back to here, if you're thinking through and creating your policies to make sure that they are actually aligned with your organization's goals, that they are specific and um, appropriate for your organization, that you've thought through and they counter the threats that you're concerned about, if you have mechanisms that you have a, a good assurance that yes, these actually enforce and implement the policy that you want and that you've tested these mechanisms, that you test them over time and that you have some feedback loop in there so that when you see a new threat or a new, when your system is compromised, you can go back and address your policies to change everything in response to that. Um, so then over time, yes, you would, would increase your assurance in the system. Uh, yes? Can you clarify something? Sure. You spent a few minutes earlier talking about assumptions, and now you're talking about trust. And in my mind, trust is just a special case of assumptions. So are you, are you making a difference? Like, can you describe the difference in your mind between is it just the human element that we trust people when we make assumptions about machines and systems that are inanimate? Like, what's the difference? Um, assuming that it's secure and then doing something else, you're 
saying, well, how much do I trust that the system is actually implementing the policies I want and is keeping people you know, safe and, and enforcing my organization's goals? How do you, can you quantify this? What do I mean by quantify? Trust certification? Who's going to give me that certification? How much money do you got? I'll give you a good certification. <laughs> right? Because that also comes down to trust. Right? So that's, there are different certification uh, levels. I don't have the name on me offhand if somebody um, looks that up. <coughs> Remind me. Um, but you can get your system, process, software verified at different levels of assurance, and these cost increasingly amounts of money, not only to get the certification, but to actually develop software that is uh, assured to that level. Um, yeah, so you could try to do that, but that's still kind of, a, you know, it's a rough, when, so if somebody says, you know, how much do you trust that this system is correct? You said, well, I have a certification level 10. <coughs> Does that really answer their question of how much do you trust it? Yeah. You can have like data or like as for software, just you can have a reputation based upon like the amount of users using it and like kind of like a product, how people review it, like if it has a high like So do you expect average users to be able to validate the security of your software? No. <laughs> days without intrusion. That's a pretty good way of quantifying it, but people might not care. Um, you know, quantifying trust is kind of a bogus thing because the reason you have security is you want people to use your system. Correct. Yeah, so this is actually a really tricky and difficult problem for all of those reasons that you mentioned. So it's easy to come up with metrics. You can come up with metrics, but it's difficult to justify that those metrics actually get to the heart of what it means for your system or software to be secure, right? Or your website to be secure. Um, as to why people want to quantify it, so from a business perspective, bless you, uh, from a business perspective, if you're the CEO and your uh, information security officer comes to you and says, hey, I need another you know, million dollars in my budget, and they go, okay, well, so you know, what are you gonna do with that money? How are you gonna either reduce risk or increase our insurance? Uh, that there won't be any you know, issues, and how much can you do that by? And they go, well, I'll make it safe. You know, I'll definitely make it better. Like, I won't make it worse. Like, it's hard to kind of talk about those issues about like, how, you know, to actually quantify that. And there's a lot of unknown unknowns here, right? There's a lot of potential vulnerabilities and things you haven't even thought of. One of your devs stood up a development server on your network you're not even aware of that's open on the internet and then that allows somebody to come in to completely bypass all the policies and mechanisms that you had in place. Uh, yeah, it's a very difficult problem, yeah. Yes, that's an incredibly important. And why, why, um, why is how people feel about security and being safe important and impact things? Feel safe. Why would you have to use security? Like yeah, so you have an antivirus, right? Why would you be careful about what sites you visit? Right? It's like the old um, uh, George Carlin joke that everybody would be really good drivers if there was just a big spike on the uh, steering <laughs> wheel, right? Because there's a very clear danger that would happen if you cause an accident, right? But and I think I believe they've done studies that have shown that. As people, as cars get safer and they have seatbelts, airbags, all that kind of stuff, people's average speed increases um, because they feel more, you know, it doesn't feel dangerous, right? Um, even though that may or may not be the case. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. And we also, you know, and these mechanisms that we have, many are technical, but some are people, 
right? So how do you quantify the people component there that they're gonna actually follow your mechanisms that you've put in place? Um, so it's a very, it's actually a huge, if you can solve this problem, there will be um, trucks full of money that will just come <laughs> to your house and back up into your driveway. I mean, this is something that would solve a huge, serious problem in the security industry. And part of this is because, I mean, you know, security is incredibly new field relatively, even compared to computer science, and especially compared to other engineering disciplines. So, um, you know, practice not that'd be good. Um, so we talked about what it depends on, right? So it depends on, you know, how much trust we have in the people, how much trust we have in the systems, it has how, how much trust we have in our policies, our mechanisms, um, all of these different aspects, right? These all feed into the assurance that we have of this system. Cool, so now we're gonna get into kind of System development, we'll shift a little bit closer and kind of go more software based, because I like to think about this. So what's a specification? Nobody's ever seen a spec before? Just code whatever the heck you feel like? It's a requirement that has to be met or is is met by the, like, it, it depends, like, are we looking a specification when you're designing something or, like, when you purchase something, it has specifications? Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, so we'll talk about system building. So we're going to build some system, right? We have some specification which tells us essentially what is the system supposed to do, right? So, um, you know, this may or may not be explicitly defined, but there is, I mean, if you're building anything, right, it's for a specific purpose. It's supposed to do something. I guess you could create an art project where you're building stuff to build stuff. That's not really what we're talking about here. So how do you define specifications? This is more dabbling into software engineering. So you could define, uh, if you have a GUI, you could define the interface, what the interface looks like, what the inputs are, you can define what the outputs are like. Um, you can also define this, you know, in English, a written document that actually specifies these are the specifications of the system. Do they still teach you UML diagrams? Yes. Nobody thought, just all immediately. You could, uh, well, I guess that's not really specifications, so. So, we say, okay, this is what something's supposed to do, then what do we do next? <coughs> do we build it? We model how it'll do it? <coughs> yeah, we want to think about how we want to build it, right? So we want to design it. So we want to say, kind of modeling how we want to do it. So this does go into the UML, so I apologize, I'll put it out there first. Um, so we can define UML diagrams that kind of defines a more granular, granular level how the system is going to work. But what's the ultimate goal here? To make money. To make money, and how do we make money? Pleasing our customers. Pleasing your customers. So how do you know if your customers if you've built something that your customers want? Making money. By making money? Crafting you build it works. They're using it, so it all goes back, I mean, you could put that essentially in your specification, right? So your specification should capture something that the user wants and will pay for, right? So that is the ultimate goal of all of these steps, right? So how do we, how do we know that the design actually satisfies the specification? 
hire someone to validate it. <laughs> You're that person. You were just hired. How do we validate designs? Furthermore, does the design satisfy the requirements, right? So it's also tied, we're also checking, does the implementation satisfy the, uh, the requirements? So we talk about unit testing, integration testing, um, any type of QA testing. What happens if your design is completely screwed up at this stage of the game? Yeah, you have to go back and completely redo it or try to hack it until it works, hack it until it works which is going to cause you problems years down the road probably. But if your company's not going to exist in multiple years if you don't do that, then sometimes you have to. Can you prove this? This may be a stretch, but isn't it kind of boiled down to uh, just like uh, computer science where we're proving uh, undecidability and such like that? Like if we imagined that we did have a machine that, you know, taking down to just because I've just recently taken 355, but, you know, halted on all inputs, uh, there's no way that we could verify our machine was equal to that machine. So ultimately, isn't it an unknowable? Uh, Yeah. 
so yeah, there's no, you know, I think that's kind of the point is there's no real way to prove any of these things, right? There's no, you know, to mathematically prove at this stage, yeah. Uh, there are people who are working on theorem provers and building uh, systems using theorem provers. And so the point here is also about security at all of these stages, right? So just like we said, so finding a security problem at the implementation phase, right, in the design or even in the specification, maybe the specification did not say anything about security. Here, after it's already built, is A, incredibly expensive to fix, and B, is likely that the fix is not going to be correct. This has come up time and time again. Um, so security in a system, if you want to have a high assurance system that you are confident that it is secure, you need to think about security in the specification, right? You should define notions here. You should define the threats that you're considering in the specification. You want to think through all of these things, discuss your threats, your threat model, um, the assumptions that you're making, right? These should all be explicit. Same with the design. You can look at the design and think, okay, does this design um, satisfy those threat models and those threats? What policies and what mechanisms are we going to put into place into our system? Are those actually designed in properly? Um, same thing with the implementation. Now we actually have something we can test to say, okay, is the policy from the specification actually implemented correctly with the mechanisms? And it does not just stop here. A huge thing with security um, is not only about is the code itself correct, because the system does not just execute in isolation like we saw. All right, that we've talked about, right? Systems have, how is it deployed? Is it deployed on a shared hosting server with multiple users? when it was designed to be a single user system? How is it configured? It's 100% impossible and happens a lot where you design an application to be secure, but it's, does anybody work at a place like this where you have devs, so the developers build stuff, and then you have ops who goes and deploys things? Yeah, so you have completely separate people involved in that, so the ops people may not be aware, I mean, it's not their fault or anything, but the deployment and the configuration happens by ops, so it could be the case that they're configuring something in a way that invalidates the entire security of your application. Uh, so one example of this would, let's say, be uh, a database that should be only accessible in your local data, in your local network, to be configured to allow remote connections. Right? That would be a very bad configuration mistake. And also the operation, so how is this you know, there, there could be deployed correctly, configured correctly, but because of um, the operations, there could be security problems in here, too. Um, and this gets into, so even if, let's say, you prove that the implementation of something is correct, all the way from specification down to design down to implementation, now how can you prove that it can actually be deployed and configured and operated correctly? or even how to, you know, improve our assurance or increase our assurance that yes, this thing is correct. Um, because we have to think about all of these complicated scenarios. Um, and this may be, so it's important when you're thinking about the security of a system because this may be a part of your policy, right? To say, okay, well how, you know, thinking through not only how is it implemented, but how will it be deployed? Who's going to configure it? How will it be configured? Um, who's going to operate it, who has admin access to your system, right? All of these things are important things that we need to think about. That was so close to the end. Right. So we'll go over this real quick. So we've talked about this a lot. So context is incredibly important in security, right? Why? Yeah, so why waste money securing against a threat that you're unlikely to see? Or a threat that you're likely to see that if it impacts you, has no effect to your organization. Um, and the key question is, it's incredibly easy as technical people to get so focused on mechanisms and we've got to implement all these cool technical access control lists and all these things. 
But if we're not thinking about the business aspects of is it worth the cost, uh, then we really kind of failed because our overall goal is securing and supporting the organization's mission, not to develop cool security things. 